This New Year's episode of the Managing Madrid podcast is brought to you by Manscaped. That's right. Manscaped is back. The Manscaped Managing Madrid partnership back in full force for 2024. So cheers to the new year from our friends at Manscaped because your resolutions shouldn't be the only things that are well kept. 2024 is the time for new heights, new opportunities, and a new look for your Times Square balls. Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra is every man's cheat code to look good, feel good, and turn the page on confidence this year. Whether you're looking to maintain a trim or go for that clean-shaven look, this trimmer has you covered. Trusted by over 10 million men worldwide, now is your time to get a grip on your grooming with our exclusive offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code MANAGINGMADRID for 20% off plus free shipping. That's manscaped.com. Use code MANAGINGMADRID for 20% off of free shipping. Happy New Year and happy new balls. All right. This is your host, Kian Sobani. It is the second annual mailbag, New Year's Eve mailbag. Second year running. I started this thing last year. Uh, it was around a time where everyone kind of was on holidays. There wasn't much news going on. And a lot of you guys were at home. And I asked for a call to questions just to put some content out. The questions that were submitted were fantastic. And the feedback was fantastic. A lot of people uh, sent us messages saying that was a lot of fun. Kept you company over the holidays. And I really enjoyed it. So I'm keeping this going as an annual tradition. This is year two. You can hold me accountable. Keep this recording. File it away. Kian Sobani, annual solo mailbag where you guys send questions in to me and I will answer them. So... An insane amount of questions came in this year. Truly, truly amazing amount of questions. And we took questions through Discord, Patreon, YouTube, uh, my Facebook page. I didn't put it out on Twitter. That would have been just a different beast. Uh, I cannot get to every single question. That goes without saying it's impossible. However, I have handpicked one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 of the best questions. And I'm going to go through them and answer them. That's how much I love you guys. All right. December 31st, possibly January 1st for you, depending on where you are on earth. It is currently just after 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. And those of you in Europe, you're about two and a half hours away from striking midnight and beyond that you guys are well into 2024 so happy new year to all of you we'll start off with that and our first question is from ranta on discord ranta says did don chilotti secure his contract extension when he said that chuameni is the greatest center back ever on a more serious note does this mean that carlo can go trophyless this season without risking his job because what's the point of extending him before the end of the season if you are going to fire him if he fails to bring home a big trophy? <clears throat> so Matt and I already did the Carlo Ancelotti reaction podcast to his contract. You probably have already heard it. Uh, in case you haven't, I'll give you the TLDR. And I'll emphasize more on the question here that's being asked, which is can Carlo Ancelotti go trophy list? without risking his job. I think he can, but the context really matters. So, two different scenarios. He goes really deep into the Champions League, gets to the semifinals, loses. Maybe the team like plays its heart out. It's Manchester City or Bayern Munich. And it goes down to the wire. We just genuinely play our heart out and play really good football. A bounce doesn't go our way. We get more injuries than we can handle. And it just a, it's a heartbreaking loss, but you know, you kind of raise your head in, in pride. I hate, I hate sounding like that. Oh, my God. I got sick to my stomach saying that. I felt like a Kool-Aid for a second. Pride and defeat. But you know what I mean. You get, the, you get what I'm saying, right? It's one thing to lose. In, like it, it is so hard to win the Champions League that sometimes I think we take it for granted. No other team has done it more than Real Madrid. But it's more likely 
than not, Real Madrid will not win the Champions League every year. If you go back through history, I know we've won it 14 times. That's a lot of times. But this competition has been around for, what, 70 years or so? So, 15 out of se- 14 out of 70. We're not going to win it most times. So, let's say you get to the Champions League semifinals. You lose in heartbreaking fashion at the death. And you did everything you could. And you win. And, uh, I don't know, the league comes down to the wire too. Uh, that context matters. Copa del Rey, we just chalked that up. Like, last year was a fluke. We never win that trophy. Well, we might bounce in the first round against the, the, the 10th Division high school team we're playing against. That's scenario A. Scenario B, the league, we lose the league by like seven, eight points somehow. The second half, we collapse. Champions League, we, we bounce in the round of 16 against freaking Leipzig, with all due respect. Those two scenarios are completely different, and I trust our judgment in the ability to have the context and nuance to analyze both of those scenarios properly. So does this mean that Carlo can go trophyless this season without risking his job? The answer is no. Uh, I think the context of how you lose or how you go trophyless matters. Having said that, I will say right now, even if we lose a league by one point, I would count that as disastrous. Girona cannot sustain that run until the end of the season. Barca are a mess. Atletico are a good team. I just, this version of La Liga right now, I would be really, really disappointed if we lost the league. I was I was really disappointed last season losing to that Barca side. This season, I'd be, I'd be pretty pissed if we lost the league. So no matter what, I think if we lose the league, I think that would be considered a failure. <clears throat> Lachlan on Discord says, Hey, Keon, I know you support a Carlo extension, and 2026 is a nice commitment from the club. A lot of the talk around the extension will be the loss of potentially getting Xabi Alonso. Do you think the fans of Real Madrid and also the club put too much emphasis on waiting for particular players and coaches? This is the greatest club in the world, and I believe more responsibility should be put on the other parties to adapt their schedules to fit our needs. If we want Xabi, we should be able to get him after Carlo is done. What are your thoughts? Cheers. Well... I kind of like the fact that we go for the guy we want and we don't settle for a plan B or plan C just because we have to. And I've liked our decision making in the last few years. You could argue we could have been more ruthless and and been more aggressive about signing a striker, getting Harry Kane, uh, potentially another right back. I agree with all that. But generally speaking... And no, and no club's decision-making is perfect. I think we've done a fantastic job. With Chabi Alonso, I think... I don't know how many times I can reiterate this, guys. I said this... Matt and I sp- spoke about this at length. I'll just repeat it more here. Inking Ancelotti to a deal until 2026 doesn't really mean anything. It's a vote of confidence and security that he doesn't sign for Brazil in the mean term, in the, in the interim. If you really are truly dissatisfied with Carlo for whatever reason at the end of this season, and I, and I would be surprised if it got to that stage, but let's say if it did, you can always just fire him. Like, that is an option. This is not a player contract. This is not an immovable, an immovable contract that you, like, if it's totally different than handcuffing yourself to a player because a player, it's really hard to move. Real Madrid in the past have fired coaches and just paid out the contract. It's just different. It's a different beast. Um, so that, the 2026 extension part is not a big deal to me. And I, I actually think the the risk to reward ratio is pretty strong on this one. I think it's calculated. It's low risk to sign him to a long-term deal with security. I think if you add even more stars to this club, Carlo can do an even better job. So I'm fine with it. Now, on Chabi Alonso specifically, keep in mind that he is just starting his managerial career. And there's going to be so much time for Chabi to coach Real Madrid in the future. If Carlo goes until 2026, Chabi Alonso is still like, basically just starting his managerial career at that time. Maybe he'll come then. Maybe he'll come earlier. Maybe he'll come later. I'm not sure. But you guys have to remember that like maybe the club knows a little bit more than us in terms of where Chabi Alonso's head is at. Maybe they've had some conversations with with Chabi 
behind the scenes and, and Chabi has reported, you know, I'm 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 saying at Leipzig. Like he just obviously extended. I'm not too worried about a different club snatching him up right now, like a Bayern or a Liverpool. Liverpool have Klopp. That guy's not going away anywhere. That guy has enough credit in the bank for the next decade. And uh I think Chabi really likes Leipzig. So I don't think we need to sweat that part of it as like we, we we sometimes we act like this Chabi Alonso train is passing by and will never come back. I don't see it that way. The real Baslon on Discord says, "A personal question, if you don't mind. If not the whole football stuff, what other job do you think you'd be doing right now?" And by the way, has someone ever told you that you kind of look like the lead singer from the group Outlandish? I think his name is Isam. I googled it. I, no one's ever told me this. Um, I've never heard of this. <laughs> I've never heard of this group. Um, I can kind of see it. I guess I don't know if I have if, I, if my beard gets a little bit too bushy. Seems like it. I can I can kind of see it. Maybe I don't know. I'm I'm not really qualified to speak on this. If someone else thinks I do, you can feel free to chime in. If I wasn't doing football stuff, what would I do? Well, I think I would be in the sphere of football somehow. Um, I'm really into... Uh, I used to do a lot of coaching when I was younger. And uh, one of my best friends has an academy. I think I would probably be... Might be involved in his academy somehow. He's he's doing some amazing work. And already has developed some, some incredible talent. And shipped him off to different teams in Europe. I might be doing something like that if it's not this, like, you know, if it's not a Real Madrid podcast. The other thing I think I'd be doing for sure, now that I have this online stuff figured out, I understand marketing funnels. I understand uh, how to put up content, how to get the numbers, how to get those numbers then to uh, subscribe and pay and turn it into a business model. If I wasn't doing a Real Madrid podcast, I'd probably do so- doing something like that online. Um, whether it's through self-help or online training or something or online coaching, I think it would be an online sphere regardless. Something like this, but not managing Madrid. If there was ever a situation where, let's pretend like this in- whole internet, the- all these internet opportunities just didn't exist. Like, you know, my dad would never be able to have done what I'm doing now, Right when he first came over to Canada from Spain. But he had you know, he had to do more labor work and more brick and mortar stuff. If if I was born in that era, I think what I would actually do is go into sales. Um I'd I'd be really interested in getting into sales and learning more. And I've had to do that for this podcast. I think that's one of the most underrated things about podcasting you know when when people ask me like how do I do a football podcast what do I do like the most underrated thing I think that you have to learn and no one ever talks about this like forget about how to analyze football like forget about how to um talk about the game like half of it is like how the hell are you going to market it how do you how are you going to present yourself what is your vocal tonality like how are you dealing with people how do you um, ask questions. How do you create marketing funnels to draw more people into that podcast and then monetize it? So I've had to learn a lot of that through my own research and reading. And uh, I just read a great book, The Way of the Wolf. Jordan Belfort. Yeah, The Wolf of the Wall Street Guard. Leo DiCaprio. The real guy. I know he's controversial. I know he's done a lot of bad things in the past, but I don't you know, read books from those people to learn about how to be a good person or whatever. I just like his sa- the way he does sales is in- incredible. And so I've been learning a lot from people like him and just other podcasts and mentors that are much bigger than me. They've taught me a lot. So I- getting into sales is- has been really fascinating to me, how to deal with the human psychology and um, buying resistance. So I'd be su- doing something in sales. The other thing that I, I would probably do, like if tomorrow... I lost everything. I would probably just do Uber. I would literally do Uber and listen to audiobooks all day because 
any job you can do where you can just listen to something, um, do it. Especially if the salary is decent and it's enough to pay the bills. The amount you'll learn while driving around if you listen to audiobooks and podcasts all day to be able to double down and make more money, it would probably be that. So I do something online. That's number one. Number two is if on, if the internet just stopped ex- existing, I would do sales and then probably Uber. Poncho Mike on Discord says, Happy New Year, everyone. Out of the below characteristics, what percentages result in the most effective version of Real Madrid traditionally? Tactics, skill, drive, team depth, and lastly, if there would be another characteristic, what would it be? Much love. Love this question. So the four categories are tactics, skill, drive, and team depth. What percentage of each is the most important to success in Real Madrid's history? I'm going to combine skill and drive. We're going to call it scribe. Scribe is one category. It's not enough to have skill. It's not enough to have drive. It's like a lot of people have drive, but they just can't put together the talent (laughs) to be on a football pitch for Real Madrid. There's a lot of skillful players in the world too. A lot of people with a lot of talent and skill. You think about Jesse, for example. You think about Usman Dembele. Do they have the drive necessary? Um, In both Dembele and Jesse's case, to be fair, they had injuries. But there was definitely clear question marks about their commitment as well. And where their head is at. Eden Hazard is another great example. What's most needed at Real Madrid is scribe, which is skill and talent, skill and drive put together. And you think back all the way to the 50s. If you haven't already, by the way, go and read a book called Di Stefano, written by Ian Hawkeye. It's incredible. And to me, a lot of Real Madrid's DNA started there. Like, there's a whole 50 years of Real Madrid history before that, obviously, with Santiago Bernabeu. And before that, Arthur Johnson, the way these guys kind of just built the team and and made it what it is today. But in terms of like the pure DNA of like where this never die mentality and the European success came from, it starts with him. He really was the Michael Jordan of his time, the way he thought about the game, his insane competitiveness. And then you fast forward to someone like Cristiano Ronaldo and now Jude Bellingham, I think has it. It's scribe, it's skill and drive. That's those are the two most important things. After that, I'll go tactics uh, and team depth. Tactics, look, individual brilliance and transcendent superstars. These guys transcend tactics. That's the reality. Those are the one. Those are the guys that win you the trophies. You can have the greatest tactics in the world. If you don't have those players, it's going to be really hard to win championships. And Maza on Discord says. Hello all, this is a question and kind of a statement. I may be behind on you, all speaking on the corruption in UEFA. But just this morning, or at least on the east coast of the US, we heard that Serie A has done something to not allow teams to join the Super League. It is so clear that UEFA and FIFA are strong-handing these teams, as every team which has rejected the Super League has stated they are backing the ECA, an association which was essentially created by UEFA and chairmaned by Nasser. This is the highest form of corruption, and the world is turning a blind eye to it. Have you heard of this? Had to take a sip of coffee for that one. I I ultimately think it's kind of a good thing when we hear stories like the Italian Football Federation essentially advocating and putting out policies to ban teams from Serie A if they decide to join the Super League. In part, not because I think it's <laughs> an ethically good thing to do. I mean, although like this is capitalism, right? We, everyone has the right to do what they want. The Italian Football Federation has a right to say, hey, if you want to go and join something, go ahead, but this is our league and you're not allowed to participate. But I do think ultimately these things are a good thing in part because I think it wakes people up to be like, hold on a second. 
are these really the, the, the leagues we want to be supporting? And I'm not saying the Super League is this all-encompassing ethical thing that's being built, but I'm just saying that I think, generally speaking, the more attention these leagues bring to themselves about how uh, how unlikable they are, I guess, and all the things they do that we just don't like, and obviously the the corrupt element of it and the amount of financial fair play rules that are allowed to be broken by the big teams that have so much money to pay it off, it doesn't matter. The more attention that's brought to that stuff is a good thing. So I'm okay with Serie A doing that. I think it brings attention to it. And maybe eventually if more stuff like that happens, people just get fed up and and you'll see teams trying to think about a breakaway. Sheikh Khatiri says, Hey, Keon, happy almost New Year. What do you think our best starting 11 will be next season? In other words, predict our transfer next season and decide the best 11 accordingly. Second question with Vinny back and JRB, so inform, what should our front look like? Uh, the start, second question is pretty easy to me. I love what Brahim is doing, but he's not better than Vinicius and Rodrigo. So... Our front, uh, our three best attacking players are still Vinicius, Rodrigo, and Bellingham. I'd love to see those three healthy and a bunch of games under their belt together because that's what I was excited for at the beginning of the season. We haven't seen it enough, and I want to see those three cook together. And Bellingham, obviously, pretty much the 12th man off the bench in attack. Uh, next season, starting 11, I've never gotten these predictions correct, but here we go. Can't believe I'm saying this. Can't believe we're back here already. It's December 31st. It goes Courtois, Carvajal, Militao, Rudiger. I'm going to go out on a limb and say Alfonso Davies. I don't feel great about it just because I know what I know. It's not a foregone conclusion, but I'm leaning towards towards it happening. Um, at this time, there is no real evidence that that will happen. There still hasn't been. By the way, just a, just a side note: if you ever hear a report about Alfonso Davies, there is pretty much one person who knows the truth, and it's me. And I can't exactly tell you why, but just by some sheer luck, uh, Canada is a big country. But just by some sheer luck, I grew up in the right place in Canada to know exactly what's going on with Alfonso Davies at all times. All these reports this past week about Bayern increasing their offer, and before that, Real Madrid submitting an offer, none of that has happened. We're still where we were a month ago, which is Bayern and Davies have not negotiated yet. Real Madrid have not put in an offer. The new Bayern board is... Kind of oblivious to the old, to the, to what Davies and the old Bayern board have discussed, so the negotiations kind of have to start from scratch, not knowing like what the 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 almost offer was before the old regime left. So they're trying to figure that out. That's it. Um, nothing else has happened. So I'm going to go Davies left back, uh, and then midfield I'm going to go Chuomeni, Kamavinga, Fede Valverde. Jude Bellingham, Vinicius Jr., and Rodrigo Gosh. I'm going out on a limb, and I'm just going to say we're going to miss out on Mbappe. In part, maybe because I'm just so over it. I could be wrong. For, it'd be funny because like, if all the times that I was wrong about Mbappe, now, it's, now I'm wrong that he just won't come. Uh, but I guess it's a welcome problem to have that you do get him because he's obviously one of the top three players in the world at the very least, probably top two, possibly one. So with that being the case, if he does come and I have to switch it up and insert Mbappe in there, I will. I don't think it's going to be a dramatic difference though from this season to next season. I think if we, it's going to be one or two maximum change into our starting eleven. That's my prediction. Anthony Tharp says, Hey, Kiana, I hope you're enjoying your holidays with loved ones and friends. I'd like to take a moment to say thank you to the managing Madrid staff and the community you all have. You all have built. Where I live, there are not many Real Madrid fans. It has been a pleasure communicating with fans of this great club. 
Looking back on 2023, it has been quite a hectic year as a Madridista. Historic wins, embarrassing losses, legends have left, new legends were made, devastating injuries, disappointing first half of the year, and a remarkably sec- successful second half. Originally, my question was going to be, what are your favorite moments of the year? I'd like to switch that up a bit and ask, what are your favorite hipster moments of the year? I'll give you a few of mine, maybe to help spark your memory. One, the Bernabeu's reaction to Benzema's extra time go-ahead goal versus Atletico in the Copa del Rey. It was beautiful to watch the crowd singing, jumping, and waving their scarves. That moment exemplified how this squad has endeared themselves to all Maridistas. Two, Vinny's double touch assist to complete Benzema's hat trick in his final Clasico, a skill so sublime it even drew oohs and ahs from the Blaugrana crowd. And three, Jude standing over the ball at the end of the Getafe match. Not even five minutes after scoring the winner in his debut at the Bernabeu, a Getafe player pushes him away. Jude responds with a little smirk and wink at the crowd, proving he's not only a big moment player, but a true showman at 20 years old. As always, thank you for the hard work. I hope you all have a fun and safe New Year's Eve. Great choices. Uh, I'll add. I'll add just one because if we're going through his uh, hipster moments, you know, I'm obviously not going to say the Jude Golasso or the game winner against Barca this season. And last, the first, you know, 2023 calendar year last season wasn't wasn't filled with great memories apart from some of the Champions League stuff that was happening against Liverpool, Chelsea. And uh, the first leg against City was okay too. The second half was great. This season's Classico, a nerdy hipster moment that I enjoyed was Kamavinga coming on in the second half at the Manjuic and playing as an inverted left back getting out into all these channels in between the lines in Barca's zone 14, popping up in these central areas and creating these incredible new outlets that we didn't have in the first half and making everyone's life easier. Camavinga versus Barcelona's second half performance off the bench was one of the best performances this season, uh, underrated. I'll give you one more. So I was very lucky enough to be at Sanford Bridge last season, as well as Anfield, as well as the Etihad. Now that I, yeah, I, I went to all three of those. Um, I really, really liked the atmosphere at Anfield. Just sitting there as a Madridista, I was lucky enough to witness, you know, that five-two, some incredible goals. Remember that Luka Modric run to set up Vinicius and then Benzema, incredible stuff. Uh. I really enjoyed the You'll Never Walk Alone. I remember sitting there and I was like, wow, this is um, this is just really special. I've heard You'll Never Walk Alone on YouTube, obviously. It seemed cool, like, okay, cool chant. When you hear it in person, it's just so loud. And there's a point where they turn off the music and the fans sing the rest. Really incredible to hear that and experience that in person. I'm I'm really grateful for this job to be just for little moments like that. I always enjoy the pregame stuff that happens in the stadium. Etihad actually blew me away. I was shocked at how good that was. Obviously, there's a lot of jokes about Etihad, but if there's a huge Champions League game, it's actually pretty amazing. I, I won't lie. Etihad was amazing. It was a terrible night f- for obvious reasons, but... It was pretty incredible to see the atmospheres of those away games. And I'm excited to venture into more this season. Leipzig, I've never been to. And beyond that, who knows where we'll end up. But those those moments were, were really special. Shupi says, Which Real Madrid player would you want to accompany on a two-week courtside NBA watching tour? <sighs> um, Pretty easy. I know it's easy to say Vinicius and Kamavinga because they're such fun people. And uh, obviously Vinicius is world famous after his NBA tour this past week. I'm going to say Tony Cruz. Cruz, an NBA, uh, avid NBA watcher. He watches basketball, not football, according to himself. He's always tweeting late at night when those Mavericks games are on. 
I think it'd be really cool to just sit with Cruz and just talk about basketball and life. I'm going to pick Tony Cruz. KJ85 on Discord says, Hey, Keanu and Lucas, and Happy New Year. Oh, Lucas gets a shout out. Yeah, it's just me today, KG. He says, I don't know if this fits your next pod, but I hope so. First of all, thank you for your amazing 2023. I'd just love to share the Real Madrid journey with you. And big shout out to Matt. Anyways, my question is that shouldn't we be so happy with Carlo extending? I mean, living through those years in the 2000s, it's just so great to have a coach who is a true Madridista and is just so amazing as a person. I just can't understand this negativity some, I guess, fans since 2017 bring in. Thanks. I agree. Go back through Real Madrid history. Go back to those dark years. A lot of the dark years, they had something in common. Prolific managerial change and lack of continuity. Uh, Carlo has earned what he what he's getting. We'll just put it there. And as I mentioned to Matt, everyone loves him. The locker room loves him. So we can argue about all these things. Like the players have a say too. If the vibes are great and all the players want him here, then that really matters. So here's a. Uh, Here's a fist bump to continuity. Igor Andrievich on Patreon says, Happy Holidays, Keon. Please name one thing you're most excited about in 2024. It can be either Real Madrid related or personal or both. So I'm really excited about where this podcast is going. Uh, we actually smashed all our goals in the past couple years that we had set. And I'm really proud of the staff for that. You know, we had a goal a couple of years ago to go to every single Real Madrid game at the Bernabeu. We did that. Last year, the goal was to go to more away games. We did that, whether it was the Metropolitano, Vallecas, uh, the Coliseum. Uh, I think Ewan did a game in Almeria. Lucas has been doing the Ceramica, Mestalla. Uh, as I mentioned, I did all those Champions League away games last season. So we, we smashed that goal. This year, I want to attend all the training sessions too. So we did attend a few training sessions last year, but not all of them. Uh, I want to be more present at Valdebebas this season, this, this calendar year. I also want to improve the in-person podcast that we do. So I want to bring on more guests in person, you know, when we do those tours in the U.S. I'm, I'm really excited about the U.S. preseason tour again next summer. I don't know where they're going to end up. We don't really know this early. But, man, those U.S. preseason tours, I've said this so many times, my, some of my favorite memories covering this team have been in the U.S. Not because the games matter. I barely remember anything from the games, but the access is incredible. Meeting the fans in those U.S. cities is incredible. Uh, you know, we managing Madrid has such great access in the U.S. The club lets us talk to anybody. Um, you know the training sessions were up close and personal. It's not like from a distance on the balcony at Valdebebas looking down. It's just great. So I'm excited about that. But you know, we we did. Uh, I, I I don't really just like, I don't really reveal numbers generally speaking, but we. We did 2 million downloads in 2023, which is good. I mean, it's everything's relative. So is it like Joe Rogan, Tim Ferriss? Is it Andrew Huberman? Obviously not. Uh, but it's pretty pretty good considering where we started. I mean, we used to do like 2,000 downloads an episode when I first started back in 2015-16. I mean, now we're just light years ahead of that. And we're on pace to hit 3 million this year. But I... I'm I'm trying to hit I want to hit 4 million this year that's my goal. I think we can snowball it and let it take off and compound it and really make sure this goes to a different level. I also want to get more more members cuz and and cuz we have a lot of shows behind the subscriber paywall. I'd like to get more members. I want to increase the benefits for, for members and 2024 my oldest son Luca He's almost there. He's almost old enough to start coming on these trips with me. And I'm really excited about when that actually happens so I can share that with him as well. 
Uh, and as you guys know, I've mentioned this publicly, I want to speak it into existence. The ultimate goal in a couple of years is to have a studio in Madrid. Journalists come and go. We have live shows in the studio. And it's a revolving door of people just doing work and hanging out, shooting some hoops maybe, get a basketball net, get a foosball table in there, make it a lot of fun. Uh, big things are coming. We're just getting started. We're now like almost 10 years into this project. And... We're just starting. It, it feels like a, a startup still. Avi on Patreon says, Hey, Keon, happy holidays. I wanted to know who's your favorite Real Madrid player of all time. You have to pick one. Also, which player were you most upset about in terms of never seeing them play for us again when they left slash retired? Cristiano, Ramos, Benzema, who was it? The second question, uh, honestly, I probably out of those three, Ramos kind of hurt the most. I felt like it was just so devastating when he left under those circumstances and seeing him cry and all the tribute video, that really hit me hard. Benzema, okay, he was at a stage, I think. it. I understood why he left. With Cristiano, I was oddly at peace when he left. I felt like it was the right time to close the legacy and leave on a high note. I, th- I think he's the greatest player in club history. I'm kind of happy that he left on a high the way he did. Obviously, we could have really used him after that, especially that first year. It was a disaster without him That after that World Cup year. But I was kind of oddly at peace when Cristiano left. The one that hurt me even more was probably, I mean, Redondo leaving really hurt me. And I was a kid back then. And it kind of like, it was great having Figo in there, but losing Redondo really hurt. Um, Chabi Alonso was another one that I was really sad to see him leave last minute in the window it was unexpected and we could have really used him the following season as well Alexandria McCaskill says hi Kian I hope you had a wonderful time with your family during the holidays if Real Madrid disbanded tomorrow and you had to choose a new club from anywhere in the world to follow as your favorite which club would you choose and why Mm. I don't think I would follow another team. I think what I would do is just become more of a jack-of-all-trades football analyst where I watch like as many games as possible in different leagues and just analyze all of them without covering one specifically. Just kind of like what's interesting to me. Maybe just focusing on the big games every week. If it's there's a Manchester Derby, I'll watch that, cover that, write about it, do a podcast about it. Or if there's, um, you know, a Milan Derby, I'll watch that. Whatever like game is interesting in the moment every day, I'll watch that, write about it, and cover it. I th- I don't think I would do one team focus at that stage. Ananya Kumar says, Hey, Keon, why is Fede Valverde so criminally underrated? Not by you. You always give him his dues. Uh, I feel like he will be a great captain once the baton gets passed to him. We have a world-class player who is always trying to improve, puts an effort like his life depended on it, never complains, although he has been playing multiple positions. I get a feeling that most Madrid fans don't appreciate what we have in him. The way he celebrates his goals makes me emotional. It feels like he is a proper fan playing for the biggest club. What are your thoughts? Can he become the Ramos-like leader for the next six, seven years? Do you think he is currently a top five midfielder in the whole of Europe? I don't get the sense that Real Madrid fans underrate him. I think Real Madrid fans rate him just fine. I think if he's underrated, it's probably by the outside world. It's probably by people who only watch the Premier League and not La Liga. I get the sense that within Real Madrid circles, he's accurately rated by fans media, etc. Do I think he is currently top five midfielder in all of Europe? I'd have to think about it. (coughs) That part, I'm a little bit on the spot right now. Um, But I've said this many times. Um, If you ask me if I had to, if I could trade either Chu Meni, Fede Valverde, Eduardo Camavinga, or um, Jude Bellingham, those four, would I trade them for anybody in the world? Anybody. I have a pick of anybody. 
I, I, I wouldn't trade any of them. I just value, I think there's like, I wouldn't, I would rather, I wouldn't, ha- <laughs> I'm stumbling my words now. I wouldn't want to have anyone else other than those four. Even if there's like a midfielder arguably better than one of those guys, I just, like if, if you showed me a picture and all the proof that there's a player, midfielder out there for another team, and we don't have to get into the, who, the, who that player is, but you showed me that this player is irrefutably better than Fede Valverde. Do you want to trade for him? You give us Fede, we'll give you this player. I would say no, because to me, Maradismo really matters. It's not worth a marginal upgrade to, to lose him. So, I love Fede Valverde. I think he's awesome. He's a top five midfielder in all of Europe, possibly. I think he does so much in so many different areas of the field that some go noticed, some go unnoticed. He's been unbelievable in the absence of Chiumani and Kamavinga. He can do so many different things. He's unstoppable as a ball carrier. No one can take the ball off him. He's got tenacity. He's got fight. He's got grit. He loves being here. And I wouldn't trade that for anyone. And I also like the fact that when you ask about top five midfielders, arguably we have four of them. We at least have three of them. I mean, four if you include Cruz. Cruz has been one of the best players in the world this this season. Like, he's been unbelievable. So, actually, there's this is a great segue. Adam Dorsey, last question of the mailbag. He says, hey, Keon, I hope you're enjoying your holidays with your family. The other day I was talking with my friend who's a Barca fan. I told him that Modric and Cruz are a better midfield duo than Xavi and Iniesta were during the Pep era. He scoffed and said Modric is at their level but not Cruz, citing most of his passing as sideways or backwards. I didn't bother responding because of how ignorant that is. Do you think Cruz doesn't get the respect he deserves from Barca fans and or Madridistas? And if so, why? Why? Cruz has been consistently world-class for the past 10 years and is arguably in the top 10 lists of midfielders of all time and one of my favorite players. Thank you and keep up the great work. I'm taking this question because I'm, I've been driving the train trying to champion the cause of Tony Cruz as a vertical passing merchant. We need to relabel him from sideways passing merchant to vertical passing merchant because this is what shocks me about it. It's like Neandro, Neanderthal level thinking. When people call him, call him a sideways passer, these guys are not actually analyzing the game. They're not watching the games, I guess. They, they probably pick up the rhetoric from somewhere and then it's popular to say it so they say it and then completely expose themselves as people who don't watch the games or understand the game. I've said this for years and years and years. Tony Cruz is the best ball progressor in the world and as a passer probably of all time. Adam, next time your friend says that Cruz, most of his passes are sideways and backwards, please go just inform him that Tony Cruz has the most progressive passes and passes into the final third in Champions League history. History. And it's not even close. And it's it, he just completely dwarfs Xavi's numbers in that respect, by the way. You want something more recent? Go read uh, Ryan O'Hanlon, great friend of the show. His latest article uh, where he talks about the 2023 winners, like the best players in the world, what they're doing. Guess who has the most passes into the final third in all of Europe this season? Tony Cruz. Quote, and and there's charts and data to back it up. It's a great article. It's on ESPN. Uh, I'll just read this quote from the article from Ryan O'Hanley. He says, quote, however, at some point, you need to move the ball toward the goal. So who has passed the ball into the final third the most? That would be Real Madrid who have played 3.876 passes into the opposition's defensive third this year. Here is a pretty but mostly unintelligible graphic representation of the fact, and obviously it's just a graphic of just a a billion lines on a 
<laughs> it's hard to decipher, but that's the point. It's just a billion vertical passing lines on the field. Ryan goes on to say, Madrid's highest usage ball progressor is also Europe's highest usage ball progressor from 2023, midfielder Tony Cruz. And he shows an incredible graph from that with all of his completed vertical passes. It's filled with diagonal switches, passes down the line, passes to both flanks, passes vertically into the box. Uh, and he says, as you can see, the majority of Cruz's passes come from the left center of the field and fall into one of the two buckets, short passes out to the left wing, usually to Vinicius, or long diagonals out, out to the right sideline. I think the uh, the fact that Cruz has such a high passing accuracy every year, for whatever reason, seems to handicap him when people analyze him they look at that and say oh well that's easy anyone could get a high accuracy of making easy passes in fact i would argue the passing accuracy elevates his status and his legacy because all of his passes are actually difficult and vertical like we take for granted the fact that in one motion he receives the ball with one touch and then slings it with his second touch 40 yards across the field in a long diagonal and it goes perfectly to someone's feet. How many players can do that at that prolific rate? It's insane that his passing accuracy is that high. Uh, we look at, like, you remember that clip in preseason where Cruz plays that unbelievable through ball to Vinicius and Bellingham's clapping in the clip, like, mid, mid, <laughs> midway through the sequence? Please tell me how that is a sideway pass and what the degree of difficulty on that pass is. Please tell me. Please tell me Neanderthals. I look forward to you, for you to explain that one to me. All right, we ended up to, we ended off 2023 with a rant against the Cruz haters. Uh, by the way, arguably top ten list midfielders of all time. He is to me. It's not arguably. He's probably five to seven. I think he's if if you're talking about just CMs, he's five to seven, probably five. Possibly four. Uh, I haven't thought too deeply about it, that aspect of it, but he's anywhere between four and seven greatest center midfielders of all time. And that's not even, like, that's assuming, you know what? He's, he could be higher. He could be higher. Could be higher than that. I think... <sighs> I think he could be higher. I mean, he's he's probably the greatest passer in football history. Heck, man, if I'm building an all-time team, I have Modric as my first central midfielder. Cruz has to be in consideration for that, that person next one. We're so lucky to have watched these two play football together, man. I, I don't... There's been a lot of Real Madrid fans much older than me Listening to this podcast, I know some of you guys who listen to this podcast. Some of you guys are historians of the game. Some of you guys have been watching this team since Quinta del Buitre and before that, the Santillana era. You guys know how many eras in Real Madrid we've just, we've needed a midfielder like this. Think about, I, I remember writing a column about this a few years ago going back to all of our midfielders since the 90s. You know, we had Laudrup for a couple years. Seydorf passed through when he was younger. Redondo, late 90s, mid to late 90s, left in the early 2000s. Then it was like really a whole lot of nothing, man. Zinedine Zidane, in a a more advanced role, obviously was transcendent. But there was just years of... Lasana Diara, Mahamudu Diara, Emerson, these brutes, Pablo Garcia, Tom, Thomas Gravison, Fernando Gago, who was talented but never amounted to what we, we were hoping. We're so blessed, man. The fact that we followed that era with Chabi Alonso, then Tony Cruz, and Luka Modric uh, in reverse order, and man, now we were just spoiled. Bellingham. Too many. Camavinga. Fede Valverde. What? Uh, man. This is 
really a, a great time to be alive. And we we got to really just count our blessings that we, we lived through that three-peat era and still continue to see the greatness of Cruz and Modric well after that. Let's wrap it there. Guys, thank you so much for an incredible year. This podcast isn't what it is without you guys. We want you guys to be also partying with us on the yacht over on patreon.com slash managing Madrid. If you're listening to this on YouTube and that's where you get your podcast and you don't go through the Apple, Spotify, Google podcast route and you don't have Patreon in your country, you can click the memberships tab on YouTube and get most of our content there. As a reminder, most of our content is only for members. What you get for free is the tip of the iceberg and it's not nearly all the content and you're missing out on all the juicy good stuff. Emergency signings, midweek post-game Champions League uh, games, the Leipzig games, both of those will be live on Zoom only for members. So if you want access, please join us over on patreon.com slash managing good. It's been a heck of a year. Here's to greater heights in 2024. Love you all. Stay safe. Hala Marid. And peace out, 2023.